Hello, I'm Dr. Greg Fonero, a professor of cardiovascular medicine at UCLA, member of the American Heart Association Quality of Care and Outcomes Research Council, and also have had the privilege of serving on the writing group for the ACC AHA Heart Failure Society of America Heart Failure Guidelines. Why heart failure is very common and causes substantial morbidity and mortality never in the point of time have we been able to do more for diagnosing and managing heart failure patients. These recommendations are covered in the guidelines. We have tremendous tools to characterize heart failure as well as for those patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to substantially improve their quality of life, reduce the risk of hospitalization, and reduce the risk of mortality. However, study after study show in settings both in the hospital and outpatient settings across broad range of providers and healthcare systems, there remain really important gaps in the use of our evidence-based guideline recommended tools for diagnosing and managing heart failure patients and importantly, applying those therapies that can really make a meaningful improvement in the quality of life and symptom status of patients, their likelihood of being hospitalized, and their mortality risks. So this is really a tremendous opportunity that we have to improve the care and outcome for these patients. And although we can look at national statistics as well as you know individual health system reports on quality, but behind that are really individual patients that could benefit if there were changes in therapy, but yet due to a whole variety of complex reasons, the latest guidelines and the latest therapies are not being applied into clinical practice. So really it feels strong personal um, motivation to really help address this further. Certainly every clinician that's involved in the care of heart failure patients has an obligation to know the latest evidence base for treating these patients to understand what the national guidelines are saying. And then of course, individualize and personalize that care for patients. And we've had made some pretty substantial improvements you know, early on with the evidence becoming so clear that certain beta blockers could help reduce morbidity and mortality, reduce hospitalizations by 30 to 40% in patients with heart failure, reduce mortality risk on the order of 34 to 35%, be safe, well tolerated. We had only about a third of eligible patients being treated and through tremendous efforts, including from the American Heart Association through the Get With The Guideline Heart Failure Program and other educational initiatives, there's really been remarkable improvement, in fact, some of the latest data from Get With the Guideline Heart Failure shows 93% of eligible patients hospitalized with heart failure reduced ejection fraction being discharged on a beta blocker therapy and the vast majority receiving one of the specific guideline recommended beta blocker therapies. Fortunately with aldosterone and Tegnus, which also have substantial impact on patients' clinical outcome, we see a substantial treatment gap remains there, and so more work needs to be done. Of particular note, we now have two new therapies that have been endorsed starting in May 22, 2006, with the guidelines giving a class one recommendation for the angiotensin receptor, neprilysin inhibitor, a new form of therapy for patients with heart failure that was shown to represent a substantial improvement um, in the therapy we could previously offer with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, reducing cardiovascular mortality by an incremental 20%. That this therapy got the highest recommendation in the guidelines, a class one recommendation. But yet now having been available for close to two years, we see that there have been relatively few patients that have been treated so far that there has been a lot of variability. Some clinicians are applying the evidence and guidelines into practice and others seem to be taking a wait and see approach. But yet there's a price to pay for that. That means that patient, because the benefits of this therapy are seen even within the first 30 days, 
that patient who's eligible for treatment and is not being treated remains at higher risk. And so somehow clinicians have the idea sometimes that you know, errors of commission are somehow worse than errors of omission, but the impact on patients is every bit as large. If there is a therapy that could further improve the outcome of patients and it's not applied, that's going to have an impact on the patient, on their family members, it means more hospitalizations, higher risk of mortality. And we really need to do more to make patients aware of what therapies are available and the importance of adhering to those therapies. And all clinicians that are involved in the care of heart failure patients to apply those treatments. And then critically important that there's access to these therapies in, in a way that's viable for individual patients. So all of those components are really critically important as we go forward. I know the American Heart Association is deeply committed to improving the care of patients with heart failure in a very patient-centered way. There's a lot of research going on on better implementation of these therapies that we've been involved with and hope to, to provide um, insightful tools. There's a collaboration going on with the American College of Cardiology to develop clinical decision support tools and pathways for managing heart failure. So there's a lot on the way that's gonna help the busy practicing clinician that's involved in the care of heart failure patients to, to do a better job of applying our evidence-based guideline recommended outcome improving therapy. So I'm very optimistic but it's something we can't be complacent about because our patients really need us to be strong advocates for them to ensure that whatever barriers may exist around providing an additional uh, uh, incremental or new therapy that they could benefit from, that we make every effort to see that that patient can be treated and that we can take all of the available tools for managing the patients. Why well, focused on medications are also important device therapies for patients that can improve their health status and clinical outcome. And there's some evidence those are underutilized as well. So identifying appropriate patients is very important. So why well, I'm excited about the ongoing research that is coming down the pike and the potential for additional therapies we've been able to show that if we were to just all together collectively, all the clinicians caring for patients with heart failure together with patients, their caregivers, have optimal implementation of these evidence-based therapies, over 100,000 additional lives of heart failure patients could be saved every year in the United States with optimal implementation of the evidence-based therapies as strongly recommended in the clinical guidelines. So that should be highly motivating for everyone to say the status quo is inadequate, we need to do more, we can make a meaningful difference just applying the therapies that are already approved, are clinically available, and are strongly recommended in our professional society guidelines. So one of the questions that comes up commonly is so why are the guidelines not applied into practice? So these guidelines came out widely disseminated, published in all the important uh, journals simultaneously, a lot of press coverage. But we often see with busy clinicians, they don't necessarily have the chance immediately to carefully read the guidelines. When they're at the point of care, I've seen patients in the hospital or outpatient setting may not remember all of those details. So there's a definite need for developing, you know, um, more effective, real-time ways of disseminating the guidelines. So distilling them down to the essential information that can be readily available in bits um, on applications that can be looked up on the physician's smartphone or readily on the web, getting exactly to what you need when you're seeing that patient and want that information, or even embedding that in clinical decision support in electronic health record. AHA is leading this modernization effort to make the guidelines more readily available and usable for clinicians, and so hopefully that will have an effect. I've been impressed, actually, by um, the fact that in asking clinicians specifically when a patient has not been treated with an evidence-based therapy that was strongly recommended in the guidelines, didn't seem to be any documented contraindications or intolerance, what their rationale was for not treating. How many times the answer is, 
wasn't aware that that therapy was actually indicated. Does a guideline actually say that? And so there are gaps in knowledge. Or there are other times where it's where the guidelines said it, but I didn't realize it applied to this patient or why I was seeing them. I was thinking about other things and distracted. So I think the more we can make that knowledge that we have that's distilled down in the guidelines and these recommendations readily available to clinicians at that point of care, then their judgment together with the patient can make a patient-centered decision that's going to allow really optimization of therapy for the right patient getting the right medication at the right dose with the right monitoring. And that's all part of that optimal implementation and monitoring of these patients that's going to allow us to really substantially improve outcome with our existing therapies while we continue the search for additional ways of improving outcome for our heart failure patients. The thing that is so important is for those patients who truly get optimal medical therapy, the marked improvement in ejection fraction and quality of life that can be achieved. We recently reported on a group of heart failure patients where in response to evidence-based medication, they had substantial improvement in their left ventricular ejection fraction. So this is a group of patients referred to heart failure with improved ejection fraction. Um, And this group of patients really had remarkable outcomes very infrequently hospitalized with outstanding survival. So we can really bend the outcome curve for patients with heart failure applying the existing therapies. And that's why the guidelines are so critically important, the evidence of implementing, disseminating guidelines and participating in quality improvement programs like Get With the Guideline Heart Failure, similar outpatient quality improvement programs for heart failure really can make a meaningful difference of capturing the data of how well you are applying the evidence-based therapies, the quality of care being provided to these patients, what are the opportunities to improve, and then really putting an effort in to making sure every eligible patient in every setting is receiving the right therapies unless there's a clearly documented reason, a contraindication, documented intolerance, or other physician or patient rationale for not applying the therapy. Our patients with heart failure really deserve the best that we can provide them and really um, me and others uh, working with the American Heart Association are deeply committed to uh, keeping those patients uh, going as best uh, that they can to really overcome this condition of heart failure and have the most optimal quality of life and clinical outcomes possible. I'm Dr. Greg Fonero. You're watching AHA Heartbeats, where science is knowledge in process.